structure of the atom. So we talked about how electrons were discovered. And this was a big discovery because now they realized that there were particles inside of these atoms that we thought were indestructible. So this led to more questions. What else might be inside the atom? They knew that atoms themselves were electrically neutral. They didn't have a positive or negative charge. So if they've got these little negatively charged pieces inside of them, then there has to be something in there that's positive that's going to offset the charge. And then how do those positive and negative charges work together inside the atom? So Thomson came up with what's known as the plum pudding model. We are not familiar with plum pudding in the United States. He was, he was English. Um, the closest thing we have to plum pudding would be like a blueberry muffin. So in a blueberry muffin, I hope you guys had lunch, um, you know, you've, you've got the muffin stuff, the cakey part, and then there's blueberries kind of spotted throughout. Or you could think about a chocolate chip cookie, I suppose. So in this model, the negatively charged electrons are like the blueberries in the muffin. And they are inside of this larger body of the muffin itself. Okay, and this was his idea of what the atom was like. So as a scientist, you don't just have ideas and then let them sit there. You test them to see if they're correct or not. Before we can talk about how that model was tested, we need a very short introduction to radioactivity. Uh, radioactivity is the emission of small energetic particles from the core of certain unstable nuclei. And this was discovered at the end of the 19th century um, by Henri Becquerel and Marie Curie. You've probably heard of Marie Curie. And the awesome thing about radioactivity is this allowed scientists to probe the structure of the inside of the atom. This wasn't possible before. Three types of radiation that we're going to mention now, alpha particles, beta particles, and gamma rays. And they're just named for the first three letters of the Greek alphabet. The one we're going to talk about right now are the alpha particles. Alpha particles are positively charged, and of these three types of radiation, they're the most massive. They have the most mass. They're still crazy small. So back to the model of the atom. Ernest Rutherford had worked with Thompson. Thompson was the one who came up to the, with this plum pudding model, and Rutherford set out to prove that the plum pudding model was correct. He's going to test it and show that it's correct. So in 1909, he did an experiment. It's called Rutherford's gold foil experiment. So he directed a stream of these positively charged alpha particles at a very, very thin sheet of gold foil. And the plum pudding model predicted that the particles would just go straight through the gold foil. These positive charged particles would just pass through this cakey part of, of the um, atom. But what actually happened? Here's an illustration of the setup. Here's the source of the alpha particles, and they're shooting a beam of alpha particles at a very thin sheet of gold foil. They expected the particles to go straight through. A lot of them did, but some of them bounced back. And this circular thing here is a detector that allows them to see where those particles were going, because of course they're too small to uh, be seen. What happened was very unexpected. So a lot of the particles went straight through, but about one in 20,000 bounced back. And Rutherford said this was about as credible or believable as if you had fired a 15-inch shell at a piece of tissue paper and it came back and hit you. So imagine a cannon with a 15-inch cannonball and you're shooting it at a piece of tissue paper. The, the tissue paper that's in those gift bags from Christmas, right? Stretched out piece of tissue paper, you're shooting a 15-inch cannonball at that. What do you expect to happen? It's going to blow straight through. No, it bounces off the tissue paper, comes back and hits you in the face. Would you be surprised? Dead. Yes, and you'd be dead. You'd be very briefly surprised, and then you'd be dead. This, this is how surprised they were. They did not expect particles to bounce back. 
obviously the model is not working very well. So we have to come up with a new model to explain this. So here's what they expected to happen, that these alpha particles would just pass straight through. The actual result, yeah, a lot of them pass straight, straight through, but some of them bounced back. That means that those particles must have hit something large in comparison to themselves. We don't expect the particles here to bounce off. Even if they hit an electron, the electrons are much smaller than the alpha particles. They're just going to blow th straight through. But they hit something large. So he concluded that matter must not be as uniform as it appears. I mean, look at the bench top here. It's black and mostly smooth and shiny. And it looks continuous, doesn't it? There's some seams, but you know the parts in between, it looks smooth and continuous. It's not as continuous or uniform as it appears. There must be a bunch of empty space in here for those particles to go through, but then there must be also something in there that's very, very dense for those alpha particles to bounce off of. And the idea was that this is the nucleus. And inside the nucleus, we have the protons and we have neutrons, and we'll get to the neutrons in a minute. Any questions? So Rutherford came up with the nuclear theory of the atom. Three basic ideas. Most of the atom's mass and all of its positive charge are contained in a small core called the nucleus. Most of the volume of the atom is empty space. Within that empty space, we have tiny, negatively charged electrons that are dispersed. This theory says nothing about what the electrons are doing. We'll get to that later. Yes? How does he know the electron and bounce off another electron? Well, um, possibly an electron could bounce off of another electron. But in the experiment, he was shooting alpha particles, which are much larger than electrons. Like. I don't know, 10,000 times larger? They're positive? They're positive. So perhaps the, the nuclear energy of the electron held the electron in its place, and then the, the opposite forces, when it came, it bounced back without even touching the electron. The forces just sent it back. Even though it was much larger, the force was strong enough to send it back. And, and that's a, that is a, a reason. Like yeah. nucleus, maybe. Well, that is a reasonable hypothesis. Maybe it's just gravity, you know? Yeah. Those are good ideas, but further experimentation has, has uh, pretty much proven, as much as anything can be proved, that there is a nucleus. Right. Yeah. Most likely. Well. It's still just a theory. It, yeah, it's still just a theory, but no one has been able to, no one has been able to come up with anything that contradicts it. Yes? So why those, uh, the alpha particles bounced back because they hit the nucleus, and the nucleus is very dense. So if you shot that cannonball at, um, let's see, maybe a solid steel wall, three feet thick, what would you expect the cannonball to do when it hit three feet of solid steel? bounce back because what it's hitting is more massive and more dense than the object coming at it, right? If you hit something like a wooden wall, which is less massive, then you would expect it to break through. But the fact that these nuclei, the, well, the alpha particles, I know what they are, but I haven't told you about that. Um, the fact that the alpha particles bounced back means that they were hitting something very, very dense. And so that's what, why they came up with this idea of the nucleus. And further experimentation and testing has confirmed that, and no one has able, you know, come up with any other ideas or any experiments that says there is no nucleus. Around the nucleus, mostly empty space. 
And the other important idea here is that there are as many negatively charged electrons outside the nucleus as there are positively charged particles inside the nucleus. Those positively charged particles are called protons. So if you have five protons in the nucleus plus five charge, there must be five electrons, negative five charge, for the atom itself to be neutral. Any questions? The model was very successful. There was one problem um, which showed that the model was incomplete. We didn't have to throw the model out entirely, but we had to add a little bit to it. The problem was that they knew that hydrogen had one proton in its nucleus and helium had two protons in its nucleus. And so you would expect the mass of helium to be twice that of hydrogen. And in fact, it's four times as heavy. The electrons don't count because they are so small in comparison. It's like if you're weighing um, a semi-truck full of oranges. I, I live in Reebley, so a lot of my examples are agriculture. So you're weighing a semi-truck full of oranges on one of those public scales, right? And a bird comes and lands on the trailer. Is that going to mess up the mass? No, because the bird weighs so little in compare, compared to that whole trailer full of oranges that it just doesn't matter. The electrons are so small compared to the nucleus that their mass really doesn't matter. So comparing these two atoms, the proton is where the mass is, and so we expect that helium would be twice as much, but it's four times as much. So they, you know, they continued working. Rutherford and one of his students, uh, James Chadwick, figured out that that unaccounted for mass was due to neutrons, that there are, are neutral particles inside the nucleus. So you've got your pro protons with the positive charge, but there's a similar particle in size that has no charge, and those are neutrons. And that took care of the whole mass discrepancy issue. So neutrons are neutral. You see how they start with the same same sound there. Neutrons are neutral. Protons are positive. Proton and P both start with, yeah. Protons are <coughs> positive both start with the letter P. So the hydrogen atom has one proton, no neutrons. The helium atom has two protons and two neutrons, and that's why it's four times as massive as the hydrogen atom. Neutro so neutrons really don't have a purpose. That's an interesting statement. Um, so we can make that into a question. So what's the point of having neutrons? Well, I don't know. But they're there. They're in there. Um, you know, seeking the purpose of something like that, um, that's, that's kind of challenging. Yeah. Question? They, they add mass to the atom. They, they add mass to the atom. So and the body, right. pretty much. And what we're going to see is that differences in the numbers of neutrons um, is what causes there to be different isotopes. And some isotopes are radioactive and some are not. So obviously they have something to do with the stability of the nucleus. Yes? Um, I don't know the answer to that, if, if they've been able to isolate neutrons. Um, you, could, you could possibly make a stream of protons or of electrons because they have charges and so you can get them to move. Um, neutrons are harder because how do you move them? They're not like baseballs that you can pick up and throw because they're too tiny. Yeah, dealing with the extremely small uh, raises some significant experimental challenges. Let's talk about that nucleus and try to just grasp how dense it is. Um, we say it's extremely dense. That's an understatement. If you were able to isolate nuclei without the space around them and put them in the size of a period, 
So there were some periods on this quiz I just gave you. Those periods are tiny, right? If you had concentrated nuclei the size of the period, it would weigh millions of pounds. Millions. All, 99.9% .9 of the mass of an atom is in the nucleus, and the rest of it's empty space. But the nucleus takes up very, very little of the volume. So if you had a football field, right, 100 yards, and you put a nucleus the size, if, if the, if the um, atom is the size of a football field in diameter, then the nucleus would be about the size of a green pea. Just a regular garden pea, a little tiny pea, on the 50-yard on the line. And then you have a sphere that's 100 yards across. And within that sphere would be a few tiny, tiny electrons, much smaller than the pea. That's how much empty space there is in atoms. I think if you removed all the empty space, that we'd probably be so small you couldn't even see us. Uh, and we'd still weigh the same, right? You'd still weigh the same. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's like... That's hard to imagine. It is hard to imagine. You can make your brain hurt thinking about stuff like that too much. And so then you learn a, a, a few things like that, and then you start thinking, well, maybe all these science fiction books, maybe they're not, not so far-fetched. You know, things like time travel and, and teleportation. And, I don't know. So if you took every nucleus and every atom in our cell, it'd be extremely smaller than a, every nucleus in a period. Like, right. Was, yeah, because... If you had nuclei the size of a period, it would weigh millions of pounds. I don't think any of us in here weigh millions of pounds or we would have collapsed the building, right? Um, you know, humans are like, you know, 75 to 500 pounds or so. Um, and so nuclei weighing that would be much, much smaller than a period. Yeah. It's crazy to think about. This bench top that seems so solid, I mean, you could give yourself a good bruise. I have, running into that. Um, Mostly empty space. Your book also talks about a cloud analogy. So today was foggy, right? And fog is basically a cloud that's just down here where we can run through it. Electrons are like the little tiny water droplets in the cloud. They have negligible mass. They take up negligible space, but they're dispersed over a large volume. So if you took a cloud and squished all the water together, you wouldn't have a whole lot of water, would you? It's mostly empty space. And yet, it's hard to look through a cloud, isn't it? We drove here and there, you know, there's fog and you can't see very far because you have all these little tiny water droplets in the way and so they block your vision. So clouds and atoms, both most, mostly empty space. Another way to think of it, here's a, a drawing of a scaffolding. And here's this little tiny person down here. So if you imagine scaffolding the size of a football field, 100 stories tall. If you looked at that from an airplane high, high up in the sky and looked down at it, a little bit like we're looking at it here, it's sort of like the fog. You can't see through it, and it seems to be a solid object. Because when you get too far away from this scaffolding, you can't distinguish between the open spaces and the solid spaces. The variation in density is too small for our eyes to see it. When we get up close to scaffolding, we can see that, yeah, there's empty space and here's the iron bars or whatever they're made out of. But when we get too far away, it all kind of blurs together. The bench top is a lot like this scaffolding in terms of there being empty space and then areas that are very solid, the nuclei. But it is, the variation is on such a small scale that we can't see it with our eyes. Any questions? So basically, you need to know nucleus, crazy, crazy dense, 
Adam, mostly empty space.